I think this thing is working. Is this Zebulon online? I don't know how to kick this thing off and we've got these notifications coming up. So uh, I think it's online right now. Uh, my apologies, running into some technical difficulty. Uh, So anyway, look, bottom line here, um, I've been praying about this, this whole thing, and just the people are panicking, people are out there wondering. Um, I was telling my friend the other day that what I've seen in people today, they're more afraid of, uh, of um, COVID than they are of Jesus Christ, and this is a problem. I think I can honestly say that people have lost their focus, and people in America in particular, we've forgotten God. And so what I want to do is get back to uh, how, have we, how have we lost our dependence on God? As a matter of fact, we pride ourselves in being independent of God. And um, one of the things I want to do is before we get started, uh, if you're listening, if you're out there, I want you to find a scripture on faith right now. Take a few moments, take like 60 seconds, find a scripture on faith. This is a, a sort of ABC drills that we usually do in the church. And so we're going to do some ABC drills right now. Find a scripture on faith and in the next 60 seconds, copy, paste and send it in the comment section. Um, and we'll see what happens from there. I can think of quite a few scriptures on faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's Ephesians 6. Um, B, these are ABCs of the faith, and B, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's Hebrews 11. Um, looking. I don't even know if this is live. So you guys know if it's live or not? Is it live? It is? No one's commenting, no one's saying anything? So I'm like, I'm about to hang up because... Uh, I don't see anything. I'm working this out. Please forgive me. It's just I don't understand. Last minute. Okay, so let me see uh, some scriptures on faith, please. Can you preach the resurrection? Um, yeah, so let me just stay focused here because, okay, Ben Hamilton says you're alive and Josh Dowers is, can you preach the resurrection? Real. All right. So I don't see the comments. I'm getting them late. I don't, I'm, bear with me. I'm working with this thing. That's the last thing I need to see. I know it's just. So, Father, have your way, Lord. Father, bless us as we try to get a message out, Lord. I believe you've spoken to me and give me a word for the body um, about depending on you and Father and just identifying things in our lives that compete with you in our lives, Father. And, Father, even as a nation, Lord, America, to a large degree, Father, has forgotten you, has abandoned you um, in our abundance, in our excess, Father, in our misunderstanding of what freedom is, Lord. Um, we've lost our way, Father. We've lost you. 
And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you open up our eyes right now, Father, and, and just guide us back into your will, into your plans, into your purposes, into your salvation, into your Son. Have your way, Holy Spirit. This time is yours. We bless you and we thank you so much, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So very quickly, if you're out there, go ahead and send me some ABCs of faith. Post them, um, and I'll try to keep up with the comments. But actually, what I want to do, I have a prayer here. Um, I'm going to post it on 30 at 3rd. That's one of our messenger threads. I'll put it on Facebook later on. But it, it reads, and I pray this over every one of you right now because this is we usually do a template prayer. But I'm going to pray this over you guys before I get farther into this. So I declare that you all are God's handiwork and that you, I'm talking to you, you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, uh, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. And I also declare that Jesus commissioned every one of you with these words. He told you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So I declare that you receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon you. And, and, and now, today, you are God's witness, telling people about God everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, even in Japan. And Father, I thank you that these men and women here, they are not ashamed of the gospel, because they know it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And I declare that these men and women are sanctified um, in Christ, Lord, and they've set aside uh, their hearts are purpose uh, for the things of God, Lord, and they had, they're always prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks about their hope in Christ. These men and women do it with gentleness and respect. And Father, I thank you that these men and women let their roots grow down into Christ and draw up nourishment from Christ only. And these men and women see to it that they go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth that they were taught. And these men and women will not let anyone capture them with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. And Father, I thank you that these men and women, they walk in great love, great boldness, great calling. And because they do this, Father, their speech is always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that they know how to answer each person, Father. And Father, I declare this over this generation of Christians, Father, that they will serve God in this generation, and they will keep nothing back from the world that is profitable, but they will show and teach the world publicly the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so one of the things I want to encourage you to do is, uh, since a lot of churches are meeting um, online, uh, don't neglect uh, to, to send in your tithes and offers. I still need your support. And um, I'll post that later on the video on how to, how to support these ministries. Um, so I want to throw out to you, a lot of people, we've talked about this, you know, amusement, amusement as I begin. What is amusement? A lot of people wonder, you know, amusement, and we think of amusement park for amusement purposes only. And very few people actually give thought to what amusement means. Um, the root of amusement is muse. And anytime you take a word and you put an A in front of it, you kind of flip the word around. It's no longer, it's the opposite of the word now. So muse, let me see, like theist is God. Atheist is one who is not one who does not believe in God. Well, muse means to think. A muse means to not think. And so a lot of things going on today, uh, because we we're so wrapped up in, in, in self-centeredness, self-pleasure, um, self-gratification, amusement, and, and we've forgotten how to think and think critically about things that we're dealing with. And so when when we're amused, we're not thinking clearly. I, I, I think of um, Christians are supposed to be cutting edge. Christians are supposed to be raw. They're supposed to be bold. And being loving doesn't mean, you know, uh, weak. Meek is not weakness. I've said this before. So what I'm getting at, Christians are supposed to have teeth. Christians are supposed to be bold and just exciting. And Christians should be like movers and shakers, and not, not passive and, and just let people walk all over you. It's okay to love people. Stand up with the truth and just um, give them the truth. Matter of fact, it's love that should compel you to just get in people's face and tell, look, dude, stop. I love you. This is this. The, the story that I think of or the analogy, the picture I want to give you is these, um, I don't know if you guys ever remember these wild pigs. You know, a lot of times there's these wild pigs and uh, 
even here in Okinawa, we have wild pigs and there's money. Um, the farmers over here will give you money for capturing wild pigs. Uh, now, wild pigs, they're strong, they're dangerous, they're wily, they're smart. And what they do, they destroy crops. And so uh, if you search YouTube, you'll see, and you type in capturing wild pigs, you'll see several short videos of pigs um, getting caught. And it's so simple. And what ends up happening, again, these wild pigs are supposed to be wily and free and independent. Well, what happens, uh, trappers know to put food down. And as they put food down, the pigs come out and they're suspicious. They'll eat the food and they'll take off back into the woods. Next day, they do the same thing. The trapper would do the same thing. Put the food down in the field. Pigs will come out, eat the food, and and, and take off. Well, what the farmers do, now they've, they've sped this whole process up. Now they'll have a cage, a literal cage, and it's pretty big, about the size of a swimming pool, and they'll put food right in the middle of that cage. And the, the pigs, the wild pigs, young and old, big and tall, small, they'll come and they'll sniff and they're suspicious and they're slow to go in. But all it takes is one. One of the pigs goes in and starts eating. Another one probably is looking at him like, dude, you got it made. That's easy. I don't have to hunt for the food. It's a handout. It's easy. And so they go in and the pigs are all one by one going inside the cage. And as they go in the cage, they're all eating now. And when enough pigs are in there, the trapper, he springs that trap and that trap comes down and immediately you'll see these pigs freaking out, running in circles, banging their heads against the fence, but it's over. They're done. Now, how did all this happen? They became dependent on someone else for food. What does this have to do with the Christian? This is us, man. Christians, we've become dependent on so many other, we depend on ourselves. Dependent on government, dependent on our work job, dependent on that paycheck. It's never, it should have been this way. We should be Matter of fact, the degree to which we're dependent, um, uh, not dependent on God, is the degree to which we're independent, and we're walking in our own independence. This is not what was supposed to happen. God wants us to totally depend on Him, and um, for provision, for help, for salvation. And um, what's happened in America? We've got this thing called abundance and excess, and. Uh, it's, it's distracted us from God. We've got it so made that we really don't need God. Why do I need God? My life is good. Well, the prophets wrestled with their people back in the day also. And then um, they go and, and, and give the word, the, the Lord is coming, and they'd argue with God like, Hosea, why should we uh, um, worry? Uh, life is good. We don't really need God right now. And we run to God in a crisis. Well, this is a form of idolatry. And this is a form of of, of what ends up happening, the more we depend on ourselves and the more we depend on something else other than God, it's a form of idolatry. And God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And uh, oftentimes I identify idolatry as the five Ps. And today this is so profound. Um, the five Ps can be called any person, any pleasure any pain, any problem, or any philosophy in your life that's greater than God, it can be considered an idol. Any person, it could be, I've, I've got millionaire friends, and I've had conversations with them driving across the highway back in the U.S., and, and they'll say things like, um, I love my wife, I love my twins, I love my kids, I don't know what I would do if anything happened to my wife and kids. My whole world revolves around my wife and kids. Um, and I had to ask this guy, uh, yeah, where's God in this picture? Oh, he's not that. Well, I go to church when I can. And I pointed out that what you're saying is your family's more important to you than God. And he said, no, that's not what I'm saying. Well, let's look at your track record. Let's look at where you spend your time at. And it's obvious that God is not as important to you as your family. And that kind of hurt him. It stung him. But he received it. I don't know if he ever changed. But the same thing happens today. Um, that relationship that you're in. If you know it, it's it, the timing is off or maybe you're doing some things you're not supposed to be doing, you're compromising things and you're disobeying God in that relationship, that sounds like an idol. That doesn't sound like it is an idol. And some people worship a, a political party more or a, or political party more than, than I got to turn off these notifications. 
So any person, some people worship Hollywood actors and actresses, and some people worship entertainers. Some people worship celebrities and, and, and athletes, you know, LeBron James. You're not, you're not going to miss a game of LeBron James. If he's playing, I'm watching. Or if uh, 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 Taylor Swift is doing a concert, I'm going. But then you examine their lives and, and, and you look at them and say, well, where's God in your time? Where's God in your day? He's, he's, he's not a priority. This is idolatry. So that's a person. Any pleasure. When we look at pleasures in our life, pleasures like um, alcohol, sleep, drugs, working out, uh, sports, you fill in the blank. Any pleasures in our life that's, that's greater to us than God is an idol. And I, I, I usually demonstrate like this. God says, I'm number one. You shall have no other gods before me. And then these are the five Ps. Any person, any pleasure, any pain, any problem, any philosophy. What happens a lot of times is that thing will consume us to the point where it's, it's greater in our life than God. This is an idol. And just to kind of fast forward here, what ends up happening, you have to kind of realize where you're at and say, there's nothing in my life that's greater than God. This is a form of idolatry. And so you repent and bring God back into number one. Any person, any pleasure, any pain. If you're carrying a pain unforgiveness she hurt you he hurt you uh your dad you're mad at your dad you're mad at your mom uh you're mad at your command um if you're carrying pain and bitterness towards someone and it's consuming you to the point where you know god told you to forgive and i know it's difficult to forgive i right? you know it is but you're called to forgive we all are called to forgive and if you can't forgive it's an idol it's greater in your life than God. Matter of fact, you're obeying that idol more than you are God. You're obeying that pain more than you are God. So any person, any pleasure, any pain, any problem. I know so many people who their problems, financial problems, career problems, marital problems, um, kid problems. And they, they just lose so much sleep over these problems. I know people with health problems right now. We got COVID. Like I said earlier, we got people who are more afraid of COVID than they are of God. And so I've told people our greatest, our greatest threat in America isn't COVID. It's not any political party. It's not the Chinese. It's not communism. But our greatest threat is God. But he's also our greatest salvation. So then the last one is any philosophy in your life that's greater than God. A philosophy is something that sounds like there is no God. Or a philosophy is something that sounds like um, God is angry at me. Or um, God can't forgive me for what I did. Um, God isn't talking to me. All of that is a philosophy that's ungodly. I said all this to say that in America today, we've, let, we've abandoned God. We left God behind. We have this perverted understanding of freedom. Many people will define freedom today as freedom is the ability to do what I want whenever I want to do it. That's honestly, that's the definition of flesh. That's flesh. Read Galatians 5. That's the definition of flesh, the ability to do what I want whenever I want to do it. That's flesh out of control. True freedom can be properly defined as the ability to do the right thing. And generally speaking, if you have the ability to do the right thing, we generally stay out of trouble. Now, what does that have to do with America today and everything that we're facing? Well, the Bible is very clear about this. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven. He would restore us. He would heal our land. But that's what it's going to take. And I think some people right now, the reason why I'm telling you guys this right now is because many of you, some of you Zebulun disciples, many of you are being equipped and prepared to go out because the world is in a crisis right now. Your job is to be prepared always to go out and answer the respond to the world, discern what's happening in the world. And because you, you know the world is in pain, your job is to go out and be a solution to the pain, pointing people to Christ. That's really the bottom line. What are we going to do? Because I, I know people are panicking, people are, are afraid, and people are walking around in fear. Um, my God, they're, 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 they're hoarding toilet paper. They're hoarding groceries right now. And, and so people are really panicking. And the reason why they're panicking is because 
<laughs> they're afraid, but they don't know God. They don't know God. I want you to think about America with, with your origins in the founding. What, what, what must it have been like back in the you know, 1700s, 1800s, early 1800s, coming across America and, and, and you know, making a way, making a life? Did they have grocery stores back then? Did they have fuel stations and snacks and water? What did they have to do? They had to make their way. They had to survive. And life was hard. And so if they lived, that spoke volumes about them. That means they were hardworking. That meant they were hardworking. That meant that they were figuring out how to survive, how to hunt. Whereas today, you got people. I remember when Hurricane Sandy went up the East Coast, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. And uh, um, there were people in Virginia and New York that were running out of food. And this this is, goes to the character of America. It's godless. These people were actually getting into mobs and looting and robbing people because they hadn't eaten in a day. My point here is, if you were to depend on God and trust God, he would see you through. But when, you're, when you live a godless life, it's a self-centered life. And it's every man for himself. It's dog eat dog. This is why I'm trying to stress to you all to push people into Christ, drag people into Christ. They need an experience with Christ. Um, Americans used to be pretty hardcore. Amer Americans understood that they weren't giving up their rights for just anything. Um, there was a time when income taxes were like 1% or 2%, 3%, and if it was over 3%, Americans were ready to shoot them, politicians and bureaucrats. Um, now, think about what we're doing. We're, we're paying 30 and 40 and 50 percent in taxes, uh, federal taxes, 30, 40 percent, and then state taxes and city taxes. And so over half our pay is going towards taxes. And what does that say about us? We, we've conceded and given in. Um, the last thing I want to share with you all, the timing thing is off here. I wanted to do some fixed bayonets, but... That's not going to happen. I've got to figure this thing out. If I, if I asked you what's a bigger threat, pain or pleasure, most people would say pain is a bigger threat, and it's not. I'd argue that pleasure is a bigger threat because it's subtle. We like pleasure. Well, what's what's the threat with pleasure? I think it was, yeah, G.K. Chesterton. He's the one who said, meaningless does not come from being weary of pain. Meaningless comes from being weary of pleasure. And so what happens when we, we, we have this abundance and we have this excess, it's, it's very difficult to appreciate because it's never enough. Never enough. And so I, I, I know this. Being a Christian is not supposed to be easy. Being a Christian is not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be, is being a Marine easy? It's very difficult. Is, is being a daddy easy? Is being a, a mother easy? It's very difficult. It requires a lot to be a husband and a wife. It requires a lot. But see, our tendency in our flesh is to avoid hard work. And, and witnessing the people and, and, and growing in Christ, it is hard work. Where pleasure is concerned, I, I've, I've told you we have this warped definition of freedom, but where pleasure is concerned, you just need to ask yourself, is that pleasure competing with God in your life? Is that is that comfort competing with God in your life? Because a side note here, I can say that because a lot of people think being a Christian is supposed to be somewhat easy. They haven't been tested. Bottom line here is it, it, it cost Jesus everything to bring us salvation. It cost Jesus his life. It cost him everything to bring us salvation. But we've put that question back on us. What is it costing you to be a Christian? If you're comfortable as a Christian, you're, you're, you're not engaging people. You're not in faith. And I guarantee you're not walking in love. Love isn't kumbaya. 
I love you enough to get involved in your life and being direct and just I love you enough to try to point you in the right direction and called correction. I'm not here to condemn, but I am here to, 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 to point you into Christ and the ways of God. So here's some points to remember. Anything that refreshes you without distracting you from or diminishing or destroying your final goal of serving God, that's a legitimate pleasure. Again, anything that refreshes you without distracting you or diminishes you or destroys you to your final goal of serving God, that's a legitimate pleasure. I heard Ravi Zachariah say that uh, all pleasure costs you something. For legitimate pleasure, you pay up front. For illegitimate pleasure, you're going to pay later. And he summed it up. He said, all pleasure must be bought at the price of pain. <laughs> for true pleasure, the price is paid before you enjoy it. For false pleasure, the price is paid after you enjoy it. I've known people who've had premarital sex. They had the pleasure up front. And they're saying, well, what's the big deal? We got married. Well, I don't know. What the big deal was, you got the pleasure first. Now, how do you pay for that? Well, you're going to pay for it because that six months of dating or one year of dating, that's a record of who you are. And your conduct during that time is a reflection of your conduct after you get married. So there's no getting around that. You will reap what you sow. And so, but what does it say about the other couple who waited six months to a year? They were courting and dating and they, they honored God and, and it, there's, a re, there's a record of their conduct. That's a reflection of what their marriage is going to be like. They can be trusted. They were strong. So one of the things about pleasure, because God, again, this goes back to this freedom, abundance, and excess that we have. It's, it's made us soft as Christians, as Americans. It's made us soft. Just know that we're, we're supposed to enjoy things. All right. Um, there's another principle, though. The closer you get to pure pleasure, the close I said pure pleasure, the closer you get to the heart of God. The closer you get to impure pleasure, the farther you move from the heart of God. See, it's, it's what we do with that pleasure. We pervert that pleasure. We pervert that what we thought was freedom. And, and well, I thought, you know, it's the ability to do what, what I want whenever I want to do it. No, no, no. We minister to prisoners every week who did what they felt like doing and their their liberty has been hindered. And that's the same thing with us. When we sin, all sin brings about some form of bondage. And so we yield to that. Um, if I threw out Proverbs 3 and 5, let me read that for you. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures for you. If I turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Okay. Um, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. This is the, God, I can't tell you how many people I've run into. It says, trust in the Lord, not in yourself, not in your bank account, not in the military, not in that government check, not, not in your girlfriend, not boyfriend, not in your own intellect. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with all of this. Oh, what about COVID? What about COVID? Trust in the Lord. And it says, lean not to your own understanding. Ah. <sighs> Over the years, I've met so many people in the Marine Corps and professionals, and they say they make up the rules in their lives. They, they say, um, I'll ask them, who makes up the rules in your lives? They say, quickly, I do. Well, they're trying to be God, which means they're not trusting in the Lord. They're trusting in themselves. And the bottom line is they can't save themselves. Can you save, can't save yourselves? Is it possible for mankind to save himself? No. If that was true, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Then there's... Um, Proverbs 27 7 look at Proverbs 27 7 I thought this was very interesting this is this is us man <laughs> it says one who loathes honey one who is full loathes honey 
but to one who is hungry, everything is bitter sweet. Bitter is sweet. Let me just in a different translation. A person who is full refuses honey, but even bitter food tastes sweet to the hungry. It's kind of like one of the reasons we don't have room for God right now is because um, we're already full of all kind of other things. We're full of materialism. We're full of pleasures. And so when you're full, it's very difficult to, to receive and, and anything from God. It's kind of like I, I use an example of like a Thanksgiving meal. I've, I used to do this. I can't do it anymore. But I used to gorge during Thanksgiving and my plate would be full and I'd just load my plate down and um, um, I just I just sit there and eat because it was all just so good. It was so good. Sandy is such a great cook. And, and so what ended up happening, once I got full, and I'd sit there, and I'm like, oh, I can't eat another bite. But then they would put out my favorite dessert. And truth be told, I wanted it, but I just didn't have any room for it. And it, it, it's my favorite dessert. It could be sweet potato pie, and it's just sitting there. And I'm like, okay, I can't get to you yet. <laughs> Give me five minutes, let some of this food to adjust, and then I'll get to it. But it's my favorite dessert. I've been looking forward to it, but I'm already full, so I can't eat anymore. Well, it's the same thing with God. A lot of times, the reason why we're not receiving from God is because we're already full. We've we've taken all this pleasure, all these these, these senses have been filled, and it's not it's somewhat perverted, and it leaves us. As a matter of fact, we're full of the wrong things. It's it's more pollution than anything, and so we wonder why I don't feel good, why I'm not fulfilled. I'm filled, but I'm not fulfilled. Well, it's because we're filled with pollution. And it's, it's it, we didn't choose wisely, you know, that old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, when we repent and we and we look to Christ, that pollution that we're full of begins to change because now we're getting full of the solution. Christ is the solution. And so there's that. So let me read one more. I wanted to get to um, Luke 15. The prodigal son. Turn to Luke 15. Again, we're working out the kinks here. I apologize, but I plan on trying to get you slides or something so you can go along with me. I'm thinking to do this online uh, uh, webinar type of thing. Um, Danielle was talking about Google something, conference room or something, and, or Zoom. But that way we can kind of see each other and do some interaction. I love interaction. Um, so let's uh, go to Luke, chapter 15, verse 11. I'm going to read this passage just so we can get some context here. It says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons, verse 12. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons, verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. Verse 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. 15. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. 16. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servant have, the servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. 18. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. 19. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Verse 21. His son said to him, Father, I sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. 22. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. 23. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Verse 24, for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. And then he goes on and talks about how the older son was a little upset. And 
wondering what's going on. That's another story. But I want you to notice a couple of things here. This young man, this prodigal, number one, and this is kind of where America is kind of backslidden because we're prodigal. America, to a large degree, is prodigal. We've gotten off track, and we're, we're, we're soaking in the blessings and the abundance of America at the expense of a broken relationship with God. It's important to notice in this passage that these are actually his sons, though. When I was younger, I didn't really put that together and looked at that. I thought he's just uh, a a man. And yeah, sure, it was his father, his son. But this was his son. He was never his unson. This was always his son. And he repented and he came back. And obviously, he wanted to go out and live that lifestyle. But then he came to his senses because he was broken and realized this is there's got to be a better way. I'm dying out here. I need to get, reconnect with my father, and I'll humble myself and, and I'll go back before my father and I'll repent, and, uh, and I'll tell him I don't even deserve to be called your son. This is a point of humility for for us as individuals and as a nation. We need to come back to the Lord and just turn back to Him. But see. It's important to know that those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I'm going to say this, and a lot of people don't like when I say this, but not everybody's a child of God. Everyone says, we're all God's children. That's not what the Bible says. I I heard some prominent preachers preaching on this uh, recently, and they're saying, we're all God's children. That's not what the Bible says. John 1.12 says, to as many as believed on him, gave he them power to become the sons of God. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And 16, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Verse 15 talks about the spirit of adoption that takes place, and now we can cry, Abba, Father. And then the one kicker that we often go over at Zebulon is, um, Zebulon is uh, Romans, I'm sorry, um, John 8, 44, where Jesus is telling uh, the people, there's there some Pharisees there saying, Abraham's our father. And he says, um, they said, we're descendants of Abraham, and God is our father. And Jesus tells them flat out, God is not your father. Your father is the devil. So I'm pointing it out to let you know, we, not everyone is a son of God. We're all God's creation. But until you believe in Jesus Christ, you're not a son of God. You're his creation. But everyone needs Jesus so we can get adopted into the family. Now, what I'm going to point out here is that as Americans, oh, I could really talk about America. And, and, and I know there's a lot of critics out there that are talking about America, and America was built on the backs of slaves, and America was stole the land from the Indians and genocide over the Indians and all that. And uh, that's worthy of discussion if you're open for it. But there's a lot more to the story than that, that, than, than these people out there just parroting stupid things that uh, um, liberals have told them. God had a plan for America. God told believers to go into all four corners of the globe and carry the gospel. He said, go and preach the gospel to all creation. And so he said, you're going to be my witnesses to the other, other ends of the earth. And so some way, somehow, God sent believers into America to bring the light of salvation of Jesus Christ into America. Well, let's fast forward a little bit. God had a plan for America. And these we were supposed to be a, lit, a city, the light shining on a hill, city on a hill. As with most things, all of us are guilty of this. When we when, when no one gets good, we tend to put our guard down and... Um, I think it was Payne, Thomas Payne, who said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That means the price of freedom is constantly you got to work for it. you got to fight for it, and it's going to be difficult. There's a, um, a meme that I often post, and it says hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times, and it's a cycle. And so a lot of times what happens, difficulties are good for us. 
They really are because they test our faith and they and they it's a test and we prove that we can do this thing and you find out what you're capable of, and especially if you do it with Christ, and you find out what you're capable of. Well, what the problem is, we, we're always looking for comfort, we're always looking for pleasure, and we forget about remaining sharp and strong. And so we create these good times, and then everyone's getting along, and we forget about you know, what got us here and what made us sharp. And then it, it kind of makes us lazy, and then we become weak men. Now, when I'm talking about men, I'm talking about mankind. I'm getting butthurt over you know, me using the word men to include women also. It's mankind. And so what happens, we begin to create weak men. We have a culture of weak people right now. But but I'm not even talking about out in public. I'm talking about in the church. Christians, I meet, I meet so many Christians who, who just have not been discipled, who don't know the faith. And, and honestly speaking, they're the ones who are my biggest critics, my biggest, my biggest liability, my biggest drag. Which is why... It's kind of cut to the chase with this stuff, and I, and I, and I talk to Christians directly because we need to make disciples quickly because there's a war going on. And so if I can get you learned up, discipled, and back out there in the fight, we have a better chance of saving people, converting people. I know what I'm saying is true is because I meet these people all the time. They identify with Christ. They say they're Christian, whether they are or not. I don't know. I don't see any fruit in their lives. But these same people oppose me just about at every turn with things like um, God made them that way. God loves them just the way they are. Um, gender fluidity, um, social justice. Um, golly, this is, here's a big one. White privilege exists. Um, Black Lives Matter, you know, that whole spirit behind that movement. All of these are controversial issues, but the Bible talks about these issues. And it's, it's really not complicated if you know the Word of God. What I'm getting at, this is just a reflection of how lost we are, how undiscipled we are. And these people, they go around basing morality on their feelings instead of the Word of God. And I refer to them as opinion Christians, not word-based Christians. Now, having said all that, um, if I had to sum this up, faith takes hard work. Being an American takes hard work. Being a Christian takes hard work. And you can wrap that around being a husband, being a father, being a man, being a wife, being a mother, being a daughter, being a woman. According to God's standard, it's going to take hard work. The problem is our flesh doesn't want to work. We want to just... We want the easy way. I'm, I'm that kind of path of least resistance kind of guy. But I've learned that the path of least resistance doesn't test me, doesn't try me, refine me. And so I, I've learned this. I had to teach me this, but I kind of saw this throughout my years of life is that, honestly speaking, I could never fully appreciate something that I did not personally work hard for. I'll say that again. I can never fully appreciate something I didn't work hard for. It's kind of like, let's say, I spent my life building a million dollar business in a corporation. And now, as I'm about to pass on, I want to give it to uh, Benjamin and Jeremiah. I'm going to give you my business. Is it possible for them to appreciate it the way I've appreciated it? I mean, they'll receive it, they'll take it, but can they appreciate it the way I did? What's the difference? The difference is they don't know the cost. They can imagine the cost. Maybe they bore some of the cost. But until you it yourself and know the cost, you won't. You can't appreciate it. You just won't. And this is the value of hard work, hard faith, hard discipling. Um, it's not supposed to be easy. It's not. And... Americans have lost their way, but thank God we have the way. The way is Jesus Christ. Um, and you're not going to, you don't have to take my word for it. Read the Bible, open up your heart to God. Um, as, I, as I wrap this up, 
the last thing I wanted to share with you is this this principle I learned um, from from going to combat back in the, the Gulf War and uh, in the midst of all the overhead fire and the casualties and things like that, uh, the dangers, um, random explosions. Um, there's two things that I that I to this day that I appreciate because of what I went through, and uh, I've, I've learned this principle. I'll share with that one in just a second. The first thing is um, my pillow out there in the desert. You know, I would use my canteen with a rock as a pillow and obviously it's not that comfortable and so I missed my pillow so much and then when I got home uh, after being deployed uh, I love my pillow I really love my pillow and I just really appreciated my pillow the second thing was uh, Pepsi I'm no longer a Pepsi man now I'm a coke man um, what ended up happening though at the time I was a Pepsi man and when we were so far we were on the front lines and uh, there was no ice up on the front lines. It was somewhat in abundance back at the port, like four hours, a uh, four hour drive away. We didn't have ice up front. And so we would have a lot of Pepsi. We'd get pallets of Pepsi and pallets of Spam, by the way. But, uh, um, but the Pepsi, the best thing we could do is bury it, I don't know, about a foot, two feet deep, bury it in the dirt. And then uh, that's about as cold as we can get it. And, and we thought we were doing something because it wasn't sitting sun, so it, room temperature cold, I guess. Until we got back to the rear, and when things were winding down, it was uh, we did our job over there, went home, and we went to the rear, and there was ice in abundance, and they had these big barrels full of sodas and whatnot, and I, I can still remember just popping that thing, and and it was cold, and I just really appreciated that. The principle here is that I learned was. Uh, um, appreciation through deprivation, you know, a, appreciating something after being deprived of it. And then in this day, I, I can't open up a can of soda and I hear that thing pop and I think about, and I do appreciate it um, because of that season I went through when I didn't have ice. And so it was a difficult time, but it helped me to appreciate things. Last thing I want to throw at you as I wrap up this. A lot of times we do this fixed bayonet. I'm not sure if you guys can comment on this or not. Um, but there are people, one on one arguments. We, we do this thing called fixed bayonet. Uh, one on one arguments, two on one arguments, three on one arguments, and four on one arguments. And this is where we do drills. And I'll line up the church, Christians versus critics. And I'll give the Christian an argument, or I'll give the critic an argument and tell the Christian to give them a word based response um for example and then they go for you know go back and forth for at least 60 seconds or so there's one right here that i just came up with uh now because i ran into somebody last week who said this i need proof that god is real and i'm sure many of you have run into that i need proof that god is real you know i've asked god to show himself to me and if he would show himself to me if you would do, well the bible is very clear about this let me give you some scriptures on this um jeremiah 17 9 should I read these? <clears throat> I need proof that God is real. Let's go to Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, and it's desperately wicked. Well, here's another one. I need proof that God is real. Ecclesiastes 7.20. Not a person on earth is always good and ends. Basically, everybody sins. There's nobody good on this earth. What do you mean you need proof that God is real? The proof, and I told this one guy, uh, I'll tell you, I'll show you where your proof is at. The proof is right there in your heart. Examine your heart. What's in your heart? Now, that, that lust, that shame, that guilt, that regret, that remorse, that, that, that them, those secrets that you carry. What are you going to do with your sin? Is it called sin? What are you going to do with that? And he kind of got quiet, and I wasn't with him, and I told him, let me make this real plain. Um, there are people, and you've probably done this, that uh, lust after another man's wife. And, and you're sitting there lusting after her while the while her, the husband is standing right in front of you. He could be your superior because we're talking about a, he was a Marine. 
So he could be your superior, but you're checking out his wife and laughing with, with the husband all the while, knowing in your mind you're just after him. And this day I was talking to him, he began to smile. He just kind of smiled, like, <laughs> yeah, like I busted him. And I told him, I said, your smile reveals what's in your heart right now. I said, what are you going to do with that? Because you know it's wrong. You're lusting after another man's wife. The proof. He's the one who said, I need proof that God is real. There's your proof right there, your own heart. Um, <laughs> Let's turn to Psalm 51, verse 1. I need proof that God is real. Well, David cried out, have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great, great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. This is the heart we're supposed to have. You need proof that God is real. How about the sin in your life? That's that's evident. I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be right whenever you judge me, Lord. Your judgment against just. I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. There's your proof God is real. And then Jesus is real because he's the solution to, to this pain and shame and trash in our heart <sighs> let's go to um last one there's, there's plenty more romans 3:23. you know wages of sin is death and 6 23 um all down wages of sin is death all sin comes short of the glory of god wages of sin is death that's 6 23. here's one christianity is boring have you met people that said this christianity is boring are you kidding me? <laughs> I used to go to chapels and, and I would do these invitations for some of our, our arms medical missions. And uh, um, I would ask the clients by show of hands. I mean, let's just be honest here. How many of you have have, um, have ever felt like you've gone through this dry spell, this boring spell, that God's not talking to you spell. It's just been kind of boring your faith with your, your, your relationship with Christ. And the majority of hands would go up right away. Gotcha. And I'd say, well, between you and God, which one of you is boring? And they kind of like, ouch. <laughs> and so the reality is, God's not boring. There's nothing boring about God. So here, this is you. If you're born as a Christian, I guarantee you, you're not in faith. I absolutely guarantee you, because there's nothing boring about faith. Being in faith scares you. Being in faith will shock you. Um, and so what I would do, I would tell these people, if you're looking for some excitement and some adventure, do something with your faith, at, at which point I would invite them to the arms medical mission trip. Um, so Christianity is boring. We talked about Job a couple of weeks ago and how Job um, was crying out to God. I'm going to go to Job chapter 38. Almost again. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. And then this is after Job had been complaining. And uh, this ain't about Job's complaining. The person that I've talked to would say Christianity is boring. I want you to hear the questions that God is throwing at Job after Job had complained, saying, oh, I wish I had never been born and my mother never conceived me. Oh, what's, you know, my life is so bad. I'm so bad. I'm so innocent. Where's God? He won't talk. If I could only, you know, plead my case before the Lord. Well, after God heard him whining so much, God finally shows up and God begins. I think it's like 66 questions that God asks him. I'll just throw a couple at you right now. <laughs> verse 1, chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. And he says, who is this that questions wisdom with such ignorant words? <laughs> Number three, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Four, and this is why people, when they say Christianity is boring, throw some of these questions at them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Number five, verse five, who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? Six, who supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? Seven, as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Eight, who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst its womb? Nine, and as I closed cloaked with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness. And for I locked behind barred gates, limiting its shores. And I said, this far and no further will you come. Here your proud, proud waves must stop. 
12. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? 13. Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? 14. As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay beneath a seal. It is robed in brilliant colors. Have, verse 16, I'm jump down. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of earth? Tell me about it if you know it. So between God and you, who's who's boring here? It is not God. And then turn to Isaiah. Chapter 40. Verses 12 and 13. And uh, the Lord has no equal. Christianity is boring. Who else, verse 12, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Have you, Mr. Boring One? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? So if you're saying Christianity is boring, basically you can get before God and tell him, you know, be, be his, uh, his uh, um, what do you call it, his, his personality type of agent and just kind of give him some advice on how to, you know, spice it up a little bit. Jeez, man, who do you think you are, man? That's 101 stuff. 201 stuff, let me throw this at you. 201 is more social, it's more political, it's moral, a lot more controversial, but the Bible addresses this stuff. And if you want me to post these um, these charts that I have that we've been developing over the years with all the, the things that Christians are facing, the issues that Christians are facing today, if you want me to post these, just let me know and I'll, I can put them on the thread afterwards, in the comments afterwards. And be able to kind of look and get a guide for where you're at and give you scriptures to kind of get you. I hesitate to give you the scriptures because it's best for you to find them on your own because it takes hard work, hard work. You'll appreciate it after you do the work, to, if you do the research. So Christian parents are forcing their beliefs on children. Oh my gosh, have I gotten this a lot? And then uh, a couple of years ago in New York, there was um, a group that sued the Jewish rabbis because they were doing the, um, ah, I forget what the circumcision is called. And uh, they said, it's a baby. And on, a, on the eighth day, they circumcised their baby. It's our tradition. Well, they went, took it to court. And this ain't even their kid. These people just didn't like the Jewish custom. They took him to court and won, saying that this baby has a right. What about the parents' right to teach their kids the way of the Lord? And they said that it's, it's abuse. You're forcing your beliefs on your children. Well, that's what the Bible says to do. It says train them up in the way they should go. But let's look at this. Christian parents are forcing their beliefs for children don't don't waffle on this you respond you give people the word of god so the first one is proverbs 22 6 and i think that's it it says direct your children onto the right path and when they are older they will not leave it so the bible's telling you teach your children the right ways it says christian parents are forcing their uh, christian parents are forcing their beliefs on their children yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. We're supposed to mold them like that in the ways of God. Well, here's another one. Deuteronomy 6. Everybody go to De Deuteronomy 6. Uh, verses 6 and 7. And it says, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Verse 7. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about when you are home and when you are on the road when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. So it's telling you to saturate your children with God. This is what you're supposed to do. Um, let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 28. Psalm 78. I know I'm flying through these, but you know it's, it'll be on the video. Go back and look at it if you need these scriptures. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 6. Okay, it says, verse 1, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Include your ears, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old. 
things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Verse 4, we will not hide from our children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the one he has done. You're supposed to pass on the faith and your experiences and your lessons that you've gotten from the Lord to your children. This is wisdom. This is what you're supposed to do. Um, Ephesians 6. Some people say, that's Old Testament. Well, let's go to New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 1 through 4. It says, um, here you mean, children, uh, Christian parents are forcing their beliefs on their children. Children are oppressed. Oh, boy. Verse 1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Well, how are they going to know the ways of the Lord if they're not taught? Number two, it goes on, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Three, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. <sighs> so then there's, there's more here. What about this one? Here's another one. Legalize marijuana. I got Christians who say God made all the herb and it's good. God made it all. It's good. No. And I have I meet Christians all the time, even senior salty Christians who, who say, Well, the Bible doesn't specifically talk about marijuana. Yes, it does. And so I'm you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I do know some scripture. I do know God and I do know how the, the word of God applies to today. So, well, let's get started. Legalize marijuana. Go to Proverbs 23. And I know some of you probably, the first time you've opened up a Bible in a while, it's okay. Keep opening it. You'll be better at it. Hard work again. Proverbs 23, verse 29. Now, this is about um, losing your state of mind. And so... We're talking about substance abuse type of things. And so it says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Verse 30, those who tarry long over wine, those who go to dry uh, mixed wine. Verse 31, do not look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup. I'm going to go down to 35. Um and it goes down smoothly. Verse 32, in the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Verse 34, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. 35, they struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. And so this is what happens to have our mind altered with alcohol. Well, the same thing happens with Marijuana and some 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 drugs, it it alters our mind and our consciousness. If you understand what's going on here, it's like if you've seen anybody drunk or if you've ever been drunk, then you know exactly what's going on here. You wake up and wonder where did they get their bruises from, and then you do it again. And uh, the part in thirty two it says it in the end it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. An adder is a poisonous snake, and there's this thing that um, when somebody's drunk, we call them intoxicated. What's the root word of intoxicated? It's toxic. It means poison. And so when someone's intoxicated, they've self-poisoned themselves. And then a lot of times what ends up happening, they're, without them knowing it, their body takes over and begins to kind of reject it, and they, they throw up. They, they vomit up all that alcohol, and their body is smarter than they are trying to get that poison out of their system. This is a good thing. But just don't, don't, don't just get by you. When we talk about legalized marijuana, I'll make my point here in a second, but when we talk about legalized marijuana, we're saying uh, feed that flesh, feed that flesh, all right? And so legalized marijuana, well, what's John 2, 9 say? Go to John 2, verse 9. <sighs> when the master of the feast tasted the water and now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people eat drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Well, what's going on here? Um, oh, I can make such a strong case in this. You know, a lot of people wonder, is it okay for a Christian to drink? Well, you just got to be careful about it. 
drunkenness. Okay, now I, I believe it's for a Christian to drink because uh, Paul did go on to say do all things, but not all things are beneficial to me, uh, but I won't be a slave to anything. And uh, But where alcohol is concerned, and a lot of people say, well, Jesus made wine and Jesus, you know, drink, Jesus drank wine. Um, I don't think so, because now you're talking about different, different fermented and versus non-fermented. You really got to know the difference. You know, I think it's the, the word is koinos, uh, oinos or something. And then the shukar and the Greek, I mean, the Hebrew. And so the, it, it differentiates between fermented and non-fermented. Jesus never had anything fermented, never, because to be fermented was symbolic, had, had the yeast in it, and, and yeast was symbolic of sin. So no, Jesus never had anything to do with anything sinful, remotely close to sin. Um, let me just jump forward to this. If you people say legalize marijuana, go to Galatians 5 and wrap this up. Verse 16. Galatians 5, verse 16, legalize marijuana. Ooh. Verse 16 says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Here we go. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, verse 20, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to stop right there because right there in verse 9, first of all, these people who want to legalize marijuana, they want they're they're about gratifying their flesh i told you right up front it's all about self-centeredness flesh my flesh i need the buzz because the medicinal properties of marijuana can be taken without getting high a lot of people don't want to admit this or don't want to talk about this if you want the medicinal properties of mar marijuana you can receive them without the buzz that's not what people want people want the buzz who, who do you think you're talking to and so don't let these people try to pull the wool over your eyes like this. You throw that back in their face. No, what you want is flesh. Let's just be honest with each other. You're, you're trying to feed your flesh. And the reality is when, when you look at Galatians 5 and, and in verse 20, that word sorcery, that word sorcery in the Greek is pharmakia. Pharmakia means mind-altering drug. Get the word pharmacy from it. And it's telling you flat out right there, you know, do, do not be involved in altering drugs and that's one of the first things marijuana does and so it's flesh and it goes right against the scripture right here so no oh, don't legalize marijuana you don't have to stop let's can we pretend stop pretending that we're stupid here uh having said all that i want to thank all of y'all for hanging in there i think I, I, I tried to only do this for an hour i went way over the hour um I'm, I didn't have a chance. I got to work this out as far as replying to some of your comments. I, I really want to do interactive. And so um, Danielle's helped me out to kind of set up uh, something where we have a webinar thing going on and we're going to be interactive because I, I like poking fingers. I want to know what you know. I want to, matter of fact, I glean a lot from what you all know. Um, this, is, this is a test trial run. I appreciate your patience. Um, I pray that you got something. And uh, um, as long as this little crisis is going on, uh, we're going to see through this thing uh, because God is, I'm going to tell you right now, God is greater than this COVID scare. God is greater than anything that we got out there. So uh, keep things in perspective. God is bigger than this. And, um, we serve a true, a living, a powerful God. Um, let me pray for you guys. And I, I will receive input and I, and I can post some of them slides that, like, like I was saying earlier. I just got to remember to do all this. There's a lot of moving parts here. Um, I love you guys, and I'm praying for you guys. Let me let me pray over you before I close. And so, Father, I thank you for every one of these people right now, Father. I lay hands on them, Father God, and I just speak life over them, Father. I know that Father, words that you speak, their spirit and their life. And so, Father, I convey those same words, Father. Father, and just speak life over all your people right now.
Um, I thank you that they grow in wisdom, they grow in stature, they grow in knowledge, they grow in discipleship. Father, I thank you these are your sons and daughters, that they believe and they receive Jesus Christ. Father, now they receive the spirit of adoption and they can call Abba Father. And so, Lord, I thank you you're the good Father. You're in heaven you're a good Father. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you started a work in every one of these people. Their sons, their daughters, they're, they're your disciples. And Father, I thank you you've called them into great works. Father, prepared good works in advance for them, works that they should be doing, Father. So, Lord, I thank you that these men and women are bold. Father, they're fearless because they walk in love. And love, <laughs> perfect love, casts out fear, Father. So they're no longer afraid when they tell people about Jesus Christ. But love compels them to talk about Jesus Christ because everyone needs Jesus. And so, Father, use these men and women. I declare that they're your ambassadors. They're your disciples. They're your fishermen. Father, fill them with your spirit. I pray great, great favor on everyone right now, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, I love you guys. I'll be in touch, man. Thanks.